fruit that you want to bear in our lives, Lord. We give you the next few minutes as we look into your word and pray that you'll speak and move in powerful ways here in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. Well, great to see you guys back here today. I wanted to tell you guys about 20 years ago, I made kind of a bad decision. Um, we had my youngest son was, my son was two and I had two or three small children at home and I thought it would be a good idea to get a puppy. <laughs> and I got a yellow lab puppy. And this puppy's uh, kind of purpose in life was destruction and um, he was out of control. You ne he would never sit still. He was always moving and jumping. And so as soon as I could, I signed up for dog obedience class. And I went to this class. It was in the Smart and Final parking lot over in Simi Valley. And there was this kind of salty old lady that taught the class. Her name was Danny. And she, we met this first Monday and we're walking through some different obedience exercises. I felt like all the other dogs were, you know, participating. And mine was just, Woo! And so at the end of the class, this teacher came over to me and she says, Erica, this dog needs a wake-up call. <laughs> and I thought, you know, don't we all, don't we all need that wake-up call? That dog needed to understand that he had a master and life was going to be better if he obeyed. And he ended up being an okay pet, never great, but okay. And today, you know, we have a wake-up call from the Lord. Uh, we, sometimes we need that reality check. We need that new perspective on where we are with Jesus. And we're going to see today that with self-reflection and with repentance, we will enjoy sweet fellowship with Jesus. That's going to be our theme today. And you know, the last three letters... Um, that we're going to look to are on our map here of all the churches. We looked at four last week. Now here we're at Sardis. We're going clockwise Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And um, I hope as you guys studied this week that you remembered the format of last week, that each of these letters, the construction, the literary design is just beautiful. We saw that each section of these letters has an address, a description of the writer, a statement about the church, an expression of praise or rebuke, an exhortation to repentance and perseverance, a special promise, and a proclamation for all. So each of these parts is fascinating, and I was sharing with my group that at the end, when we were asked to write a letter, I tried to write each of these parts and ask God, what would he say to me today? So this week, our title of our message is Letters to Three Churches, Part Two. And we're gonna look at, um, first, Sardis is dead, Philadelphia is persevering, and Laodicea is lukewarm. So let's jump right in. Sardis is dead, Revelation 3, 1 to 6. And it's so fascinating to get to read a little bit about these churches. And Sardis is a town, had a strategic location 30 miles from Thyatira, and it was the intersection of some major roads which brought in lots of, of riches and gold to the city. The city had great security. I think I had a picture of the city up on the cliffs. You see, this is a picture of ancient Sardis. And you see how you could see how they're right up there on top of the cliffs. They had so much security, they thought they could never be conquered. Unfortunately, this made them overconfident. And although the situation was ideal for the for defense, as it stood high above the Valley of Hermas, it was surrounded by deep cliffs, almost impossible to scale. Twice before, they have fallen because of overconfidence and failure to watch. And it wasn't even that the attacking armies overwhelmed them, but the people, the Sardis soldiers, just stopped being watchful. And there was a wonderful story of how an army was gathering in this plain, and they were just waiting and watching, and they noticed a soldier up on the top 
dropped his helmet and they watched it tumble down the side of the cliffs. And they kept watching and sure enough, a few hours later, they saw someone going down. There was a secret trail down the face of this cliff and the enemy made note that night, that's how they got up and they conquered the city. They had stopped watching. And the spiritual state of the church in Sardis was a reflection of the city's historical character. So let's read. In verse 1 it says, To the angel of the church of Sardis, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And we've already seen a few times now that this sevenfold spirit is just a reference to the complete Holy Spirit. Next week, Trish is going to look at Revelation 4, 5, where it says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, meaning just the complete spirit of God. So Jesus says to them, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And I thought, you know, maybe it was a busy church with meetings every night and committees. Maybe they had promotion and publicity, something going on all the time, had the reputation of being a real happening place. But Jesus said they were dead. And you know, I thought too, in our churches, we could get a vibrant speaker and a gifted worship leader. We can get awesome facilities and sound systems and an engaging kids program. The Holy Spirit isn't even a part of it. We can push ahead in our own talent and gifts and forget that it's all God's work anyway. Maybe that's what happened to this church in Sardis. And you know, the best way I think to talk about this idea of them thinking they were alive, but they're dead, is how Jesus talks to his disciples in John 15, where he talks about the vine and the branches. He makes it so clear. Jesus speaks of branches that are no longer attached to the vine. They're dead. They're picked up and they're thrown away. But the contrast to that is as we abide in the vine as a branch, as we remain connected to Jesus, we're alive. And only then will we bear fruit. We never want to lose that humble dependence on God. This church at Sardis needed some self-reflection. So he has an exhortation for them. Wake up! Strengthen what remains is about to die. For I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember them, what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. One commentator called this a five-alarm warning. Just like a five-alarm fire where you call in the other engines, this was a five-faceted warning. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember. Keep it and repent. So first he says, wake up, be alert, watchful, vigilant. It's the same word that Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was so troubled in spirit and he asked his disciples, watch with me, stay with me. Complacent Sardis soldiers, they didn't even defend the city. They weren't watchful anymore. And Sardis teaches us that we need to be watchful even at our strongest points. You know, they thought they were unconquerable. And it's an interesting thing that I read. It says, where we say, oh, I would never do that, that might be the place we need to be guarding. We should never, ever say, I would never do that, right? That's where we need to keep that humble dependence on God. Number two, we're to strengthen what remains and is about to die. How do you do that? How do you strengthen it? I think he goes on. Number three, we remember what we've received and heard. The psalmist in Psalm 77 says this so beautifully. He says, but then I recall what you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They're constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. 
He remembered all that God had done and all that he had been taught in God's word, in God's law. And the exhortation is to keep it. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, Just as you received Christ as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as we're taught. We need to grow deep roots of faith and love into God, knowing his word through time with him, just as we received Christ. Number five, the fifth alarm is we need to repent. We're hearing a lot of that word in our study of Revelation. And I feel like each time I hear it, I want to just say it's so much more than being sorry. Like you can be sorry all day for ways that you're wrong, but repentance is changing. Repentance is doing an about face, changing the way you're thinking, and that's going to change your behavior as well. So all of these five alarm warnings speak of self-reflection and repentance. And you know, we got to take time alone with God to hear his voice. We have to abide to reconnect to life-giving vine. And this isn't something we can just rush. You know, in our microwave world, we can't just punch the buttons. Okay, boom, on with the day. What I found to be the most helpful is a weekly Sabbath. And you know, this is something that isn't spoken about very much anymore, but it's one of the 10 commandments that we have a day or even a part of a day set aside for worship, rest, and reflection. And if we're serious about getting God's perspective on our life, it can't be rushed. We have to spend that time with him in his word, in prayer, asking him, how do you see me? I think I'm alive. Am I? And God's going to speak to you as you come to him in rest and worship. He has a warning in verse 4. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This was speaking directly to what had already happened to Sardis. This was part of their history, being come upon in the night. So they would have known exactly what Jesus was saying. Verse 4, yet you still have a few in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So this is a beautiful threefold promise. The first part will be clothed in white. And we're seeing again throughout Revelations that white represents the, our spiritual condition before God based only on the blood of the land that we have been washed. We're not trying to be right before God in our own efforts. We're solely depending on what Christ did for us on the cross. He says he'll never blot our name out of the book of life. And this is definitely concerning thought, a concerning question. But some, some thoughts are that the book of life is real and it will be read. We're going to see in Revelation 20, it says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. The dead, interesting, by the things that were written in the book. So all of this is a mystery, but knowing our names are written there, Jesus says, should bring us great joy. Our names are written in the book of life. And as we conquer and walk in faithfulness, he will never blot our names out. And then the third promise is that he's going to confess our names before his father and the angels. 
And I thought, isn't it cool when someone important or powerful acknowledges you? I wish I had some cool story about being backstage with a movie star or something, but I have nothing. All I could think of was my sister. She was a senior when I was a sophomore. And she was so kind to me. I remember those first weeks of school. She would let me eat lunch with her and her cool friends. And the only reason I could be there was because she said, yep, She's my sister. She's with me. And I thought, you know, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, yep, that, I know them. Come on up. You're with me. He lovingly acknowledges us. And he asks us to wake up and keep faith with him. Because we're going to see that with, with this self-reflection and this repentance, we're going to have that sweet fellowship with Jesus. Okay, Philadelphia, persevering church. And this letter is the most encouraging of all the seven letters. Out of all of them, Philadelphia is the only one that receives nothing but praise. Did you notice that? There was no rebuke for Philadelphia. He says in verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut who shuts and no one opens. So Jesus calls himself holy and true, which are names and titles that are given to God himself. That's how he describes himself. He says, I am the true one who has the key to David. He said, I'm the one that has the ultimate power of doors and keys and opening and shutting. He's the one that's able to admit and exclude. He goes on in verse 8, I know your works, Philadelphia. Behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have little power, and yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. So he has set this open door before them. It seems that these Christians in Philadelphia had been excluded from the synagogue. They were, had the door slammed shut in their face. But Jesus says, with me, the door is always open. Remember, frozen, love is an open door. Anybody? I thought of that. God is just saying, open, unhindered openness to fellowship with me. I am always opening the door to you, Philadelphia. And I love that phrase, I know you have little power. That spoke to me this week as I've been feeling super weak. And I just wonder how many of you feel weak, have little strength. But these Philadelphians kept his word, didn't deny his name. And they showed great endurance. In verse 10, it says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. How did they do this? How did the Philadelphian followers of Jesus persevere? And more importantly, how can we? What can we learn? I think they understood this dynamic of weakness and strength. It's, it's the one that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, But God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That almost sounds wrong, doesn't it? In the world, it's like when you're strong, you're strong. It's not when you're weak, you're strong. But our weakness forces us to depend on the power of God, to learn His grace in a whole new way, to be connected to that vine. And it says they had great endurance. Even though their spiritual leaders were rejecting and persecuting them, you know, I wonder, I didn't have time to research the timing, but I wonder if they knew the words of Hebrews 12, 
where it says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. How? How do we run? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, consider this Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. So these believers in Philadelphia, under all this persecution, fix their eyes on Jesus. They remembered the race they were running was a, a race towards heaven. And they fix their eyes on him who had endured so much more, so much more, and sat down at the throne of God. And as we grow to fix our eyes on Jesus, to stay connected, remembering it's all about him and his kingdom, we too will persevere, even though we might have little strength, right? So the exhortation, verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven, and my own new name. So he starts out by saying, I am coming soon. Is there a better promise? In six out of seven of these letters, he talks about his coming. And such a beautiful hope that we have that we will see Jesus' face. And he says, hold fast to what you have. What did they have? Jesus. They had their faith in Jesus. And no one, no outside influence was going to distract them from running their race and keeping their faith. So let's look at some of these promises. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar. Now, in these ancient cities, um, oftentimes rich people would honor themselves by erecting a pillar in the temple of their god with a prominent statue of themselves. That was how they would honor themselves. And as I was feeling all prideful about this, I realized I... <laughs> We actually bought one of those stones at Disneyland between the two parks where you can put your name. So that's kind of my little attempt to honor my little piece of Disneyland. They would honor, and, and you could still see these temples in these ancient cities. And so what Jesus is saying is, I'm making you a pillar. I am, I am putting you in my temple, and no one can ever remove you. You'll never be taken out of my presence. And I'm going to write on you three things, the name of my God, G Father God, the name Jerusalem, and my very name, Jesus. And, you know, I thought a great example of somebody writing a name on something was <laughs> Toy Story, right? Um, the head toy, Woody, knew that he was the most valued because his boy had written his name on the bottom of his foot, Andy. And this name, these names that God writes on us are marks of identification. They show who we belong to. You know how when you would go to camp and before you left, you had to put your name in every article of clothing. So it didn't, you had to show. And Jesus says, wherever you go, I want them to know you are mine. And these are marks of intimacy. Because what they say is that we are privileged to know Jesus in ways that others are not. We're his, and he draws us close. So we see that when we're in this place of repentance and self-reflection, we have this sweet fellowship with our Jesus. So lastly, Poor Laodicea is down as the lukewarm church, right? And one of the most famous verses in the whole New Testament is in this letter to them. It was our memory verse, and I'd love for us just to say it all together. Ready? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20.
In this last letter to Philadelphia, remember that last letter, they had the door of the house of God slammed on them. They were excluded. But even sadder, in Laodicea now, we see they shut the door on Jesus. They had, they had put him out. And there's four things, some things to know about Laodicea. They were located right in the middle of two towns, Colossa and Hierapolis. And historically, famously, one of their great problems was a water supply. Hierapolis about seven miles away, had hot springs with mineral water that had healing properties. Colossa, seven miles in the other direction, had cold mountain spring water. So all of their water had to be brought in. There's still relics of this aqueduct that would come a six-mile aqueduct from the hot springs of Hierapolis. It would come from there, and it arrived unappetizingly lukewarm. And some scholars recount that travelers would arrive in the city square where there was a fountain and they would take a big sip of water and just, <laughs> just spit it out because it was lukewarm. It didn't taste right. And this city was also very rich. It was actually one of the richest cities in the known world. It was so rich that when they had an earthquake in 61 AD, Rome offered to help them rebuild, and they said, no thanks, we're good. We got it. We got the money. So they were rich. They were famous for their eye ointment. The medical school there had developed this powder that was known all over the world as having healing properties for any kind of eye disorder. They were also famous for their garments. The merchants of Laodicea were famous for a glossy black wool that they used to make beautiful garments. So that's the city that he's talking to, the church in this city. He says in verse 14, to the angel of the church at Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He's reminding them that Jesus is truthful. He's not just the first thing created, but he's the origin of the creation process himself. He is the start of everything that's created. And he says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. <coughs> hot water heals and cold water refreshes, but lukewarm is kind of useless, isn't it? And I was thinking about it, you know, lukewarm is actually dangerous. I don't know how many of you have gotten sick, but my husband had got one of the worst cases ever of food poisoning from being at an outside event where the cold food wasn't cold enough and the hot food wasn't hot enough. And he got a bad case of all kinds of icky things because bacteria and salmonella and giardia, things like that, grow in lukewarm water. It's nauseating, actually. <laughs> so think about that's what Jesus was saying their spiritual lives were like. It's a picture of indifference, just don't care, compromise, playing the middle. You know, we're not too hot to be cold, not too cold to be hot, trying to please the world and trying to please Jesus. We would just want our, our Sunday dose of Jesus and then just let me live my life during the week. Lukewarm. Verse 17, for you say, I'm rich, I prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And every, of the, every one of those words is particular to this church. They were wretched, like nauseating, lukewarm water. They were pitiable. They thought they didn't need a thing, but they, deserved, they needed a lot of pity. They, they were poor, even though they were the richest city in the world. They were blind. What? We make our own eye salve. What are you saying? Naked? No way. We, made, we have more clothing than we can even sell. What are you talking about, Jesus? 
They needed some self-insight to see themselves as God saw them. They lacked a sense of spiritual poverty, right? Remember that, those verses in the um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. When we come to God knowing we have nothing up good of our own, everything we have is from God, everything of eternal value is his. That's the attitude Jesus was looking for. There's this great contrast between what they think they are and what they really are, between what they see and what Jesus sees. There's a huge contrast between their wealth and affluence and their own spiritual bankruptcy. And what about us? You know, I think we all have seasons of being lukewarm. You know, maybe even as you hear this, you feel like that describes you now. Well, the first step is just to recognize it and look to Jesus to heat things up. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so you may be rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He talks about buying gold, living for eternal treasures, not temporary treasures. He says, I know all about your black famous wool, but I want to see you in white garments of righteous obedience to me. You have your eye salve, but that can't heal your spiritual blindness. You have to look to the soothing salve of Jesus to see clearly. Instead of relying on your own abilities, humbly look to me. And then these last verses, they feel like this beautiful summary. They sound like they could be to all the churches. Verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. He's quoting Proverbs 31, thir, um, Proverbs 3.12, where it says, The Lord reproves him who loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. He's lovingly reaching out to us, saying, repent. He says, be zealous. And the ancient Greek word here for zealous is the same word for hot. He's saying, I want to stir up the heat of your passion for Jesus, your passion for God. He wants to call them back to repentance. Don't look to your own resources. Turn around and look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And our promise that Jesus is standing at that door knocking, and if we hear his voice and open it up, he'll come in and eat with us and he with us. The church had shut the door in Jesus' face. Think about that. How sad is that? How sad is that? And I had to find one of the old Sunday school pictures because I just have so many fond memories of steering that, that picture of Jesus knocking on the door. And I remember um, someone pointing out there's no doorknob on the outside. It can only be open from that inside. Jesus looks at all these churches, all these things that he's been saying about compromise and sin and wrong beliefs, and it all comes down to this. The end goal of all of this is this next slide. He wants to come in and dine with us in the sense of having a deep and meaningful relationship with us. You know, there's something supernatural that happens over a meal. I can't describe it, and maybe I'm too focused on food, but I know that when you're with someone and you're sharing a meal together, your heart is bound together. There's spiritual things that happen. There's an openness that happens as you're enjoying those delicious tastes. And this word, dine with you, the word Jesus is talking about is the main meal. It's not a quick snack on the run. This was the leisurely meal of the day where work was finished and we could sit and talk. And you know, many have used this verse of 320 to talk about 
someone who isn't a, a believer yet, opening the door of their heart to Jesus, to live a life in fellowship with him. And I love that. That was a question in our homework. Have you ever heard God's invitation to you? And I would say today, if you look at this picture and you think, I've never had that intimate, close friendship with Jesus. Today's the day. Open that door. Invite Jesus in. Repent of your sin. Invite him in. But primarily, this was written to lukewarm Christians who've shut the door on Jesus through their disobedience. That's who these beautiful words were written to. The key to opening the door is first to hear his voice. Give attention to what he says. This is where Jesus wants us, this place of fellowship with him. Everything he said to the Laodicean church up to this point must be seen in light of his loving desire for fellowship. Rebuke and chastisement aren't signs of rejection from Jesus, but of his abiding and pleading love, even to the lukewarm and careless Christian. The future is bright because Jesus is on his throne and he is inviting us to sit with him and reign with him. He's saying, invite me in and we're going to have a long meal together because I love you. He's inviting us to this relationship with self-reflection, repentance. We will enjoy sweet fellowship with Jesus. So my challenge to us today is just how can you enjoy fellowship with Jesus more? What are ways that you can stir up this passion for Jesus? Maybe creating a special place to regularly meet with Jesus. Some people have an area and that's all they do there. Some people like Susanna Wesley who had how many kids? Tons of kids. Her secret place with God was when she would sit back and put a dish towel over her face. And then the kids knew that was her time. That was her intimate moment with Jesus. We can linger in his presence through a Sabbath rest. I would encourage you, try it even once a month. Say, this half a day, all I'm going to do is rest and worship and talk to Jesus and reflect Savor and meditate his, on his words, just like a special meal, like a feast together with him. Let me pray for us. God, we are just amazed that you, the creator of everything in the world, desires to sit and have fellowship with us, to be close to us, to hear our hurts, and to speak your words of love, your words of rebuke, your words of encouragement. I pray that each one of us will open up that door to you this week, maybe for the first time, maybe in a new way this weekend with a Sabbath time spent listening to your voice and resting in you. God, I pray that you would use these times to equip and encourage us for much fruit, for much kingdom work, that lives around us would be changed for you, that foster kids would be housed and homeless people would be fed and people in a foreign land would hear about you because of what you're doing in us and through us, Lord. We ask this all for your kingdom glory in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, guys.